Hi everybody, uh, this is my second video on IFR 16 leases. Uh, now in this video, the content that I originally wanted to cover was what is a lease under IFR 16, what is not a lease under IFR 16 and those leases that may or may not be classified as a lease under IFR 16. But when I started preparing the deck, I realized the content that needed to be covered was just too much. So I have split it all of that into three videos. In this video, I will be covering the definition of a lease as well as what is an identified asset. Now, please note that although in this video, I will be referring to the accounting standard as IFRS 16, it is equally applicable to NDAS 116. So first, let us understand what is a lease. A lease is a very simple rental agreement an agreement to use an asset that you do not own. So if a company does not own an asset, it can may simply take it on a lease. But the definition under IFR 16 is slightly complicated. Let's understand it with this example. What you see here are the landlord and tenant agreeing to rent the house for a period of three years. A lease is a contract that conveys the right to control use of an identified asset for a specified period of time in return for a consideration. The person giving the right to control use is known as the lesser and the person receiving the right is known as a lessee. Now under this standard, to assess whether a contract qualifies for a lease or not, there are two components that we focus on. One is identified asset and the second is right to control use. Now, this entire video will be focused on the criteria that an asset needs to qualify to be considered an identified asset. I will take up right to control use in another video. So, for an underlying asset to be considered an identified asset, there are three important criteria that we need to look at. One, it should have a distinct identity. Second, it should be clearly stated in the contract. And third, the supplier should have no substantive substitution rights. This simply means that the supplier should not be able to substitute the asset as and when he or she likes. Okay. Let us look at the first criterion and that is distinct identity. Now let us say you as the lessee, you have leased a house. The first thing that you need to check is, does, is this house physically distinct? This means, can you clearly differentiate this house from other assets and can you use this house independently? Now, for example, you have leased this entire house. Now, it is very clear that this is physically distinct, right? You, you can easily separate this asset out from other assets and you can use this house independently. Now, let us say instead of the whole house, you have leased only the top floor. In this case, would you call it physically distinct? It can be, it can be, provided the top floor is clearly differentiated from the bottom floor and you should be able to use the top floor independently. Now, for example, let us say the landlord occupies the bottom floor and she punishes her child by disconnecting the Wi-Fi. If this would mean that there is no internet connection for you, then you are not able to use the top floor independently of the bottom floor and hence it will not qualify as an identified asset. Now let us look at if you do not have the entire asset but only a portion of the capacity of the asset which means that the underlying asset is not physically distinct. In this case also it can actually qualify as an identified asset. How? You as the customer should be able to use substantially all the capacity of the asset and you should be receiving substantially all the economic benefits from the use of this asset. For example, let us say you lease a house from 6 a.m. in the morning to 12 at noon. In this case, the percentage of capacity that you are using is only 12%. That is too little for this underlying asset to have a distinct identity. Now, instead of this, let us say you are leasing the 
house from 6 a.m. in the morning to 12 a.m. midnight. In this case, you are using 75% of the capacity. And from the whole house point of view, you are using mostly all the capacity that it has to offer. Now, the standard does not specify what percentage of capacity would constitute substantially all. In this case, it is left to your discretion as the lessee. But personally, I would think anything over and above 75% should be considered as substantially all. Right? So, we are done with distinct identity. The next uh, criterion is that the asset should be stated in the contract. It should be clearly stated in the contract with no ambiguity on what the underlying asset is. Now, the standard says that these assets can be explicitly stated or implicitly stated. Let us look at a few examples. Let us say the underlying asset is a 3 BHK flat in Pune, India. How can this flat be clearly stated in the contract? In the first example, you see that the unit is given. It's a complete address. So we can say that it is very clear what the underlying asset is. It is explicitly stated. And therefore, this particular example does qualify. The next one, if you see, it's not that explicit. Over here, they do not refer to a specific unit. But it does say that it is a 3 BHK flat on a specific floor of this condo in Pune, India. I believe that the details are fairly sufficient to, for it to be considered as an implicitly stated asset being qualified under IFRS. Now, the catch would come, let us say, if on that fifth floor, there are multiple 3BHK flats that are not identical. In this case, again, I would think that it's not that clear then because the contract could mean any flat. And no tenant uh, or uh, buyer would be comfortable with a contract which is so, uh, so ambiguous. The third one, which simply states a 3 BHK flat in Pune, India, is extremely ambiguous. And therefore, I would consider it as an implicitly stated asset that it does not qualify under IFRS 60. So, we are done with stated in the contract. The final criterion that we need to look at, the supplier should have no substantive substitution rights. That is, the supplier should not be able to substitute the asset as and when he or she likes. Now, for a supplier to have substantive substitution rights, uh, he or she should have the practical ability to substitute the asset and they should receive some economic benefit from doing so. Now, what we are checking that the supplier should not have substantive substitution rights, which means he should not have the practical ability to substitute or he should not receive any economic benefit from such substitution. So, when will we say that a supplier does not have the practical ability to substitute? One, if the customer can say no to any substitution suggested. Second, if it is too much time, effort and cost to uh, substitute the asset. And third, if the contract states that the supplier can substitute the asset only if a specific event uh, occurs. The economic benefit is, is self-explanatory. If the economic benefit from the substitution is far less than the cost involved, then we will say that the supplier gets no economic benefit from the substitution. Let us look at a few examples to understand this better. So, the first one is, if the supplier replaces a 10-year-old truck with a new one, would you say he has substantive substitution rights? No, he doesn't. Right? Because he is clearly substituting this asset only because it has grown so old to the occurrence of a specific date or event. Therefore, this asset does qualify under the lease. Now, the second one. If the supplier substitutes one big truck with two small trucks, it's very clear that the customer cannot say no, even though it may be more inconvenient to manage two small trucks. We would say that this particular underlying asset does not qualify. And finally, let us say that the contract allows the supplier to substitute the truck 
only that he needs to paint that truck with the company's paint logo he needs to make it friendly for disabled users so there's a lot of cost effort and time involved in getting ready the substitute truck so in this case i think we can safely say that contract does not give substantive substitution rights to the uh, supplier and therefore it qualifies under ifrs 16 now now when you assess a lease under this criterion you may also imagine the different situations that can occur but the standard says that please don't imagine those events that are highly unlikely to occur based on the information you have um, on the date of inception for example you know an alien invasion of earth yeah you cannot imagine oh will my supplier has substitution rights if an alien invades earth no that's too far fetched yeah the standard has actually given a few examples of events that are considered unlikely and so you should not consider them when you are assessing substantive substitution rights the first unlikely event is alien invasion <laughs> no the first one is actually the introduction of a new technology Uh, now let us say you are entering into the lease contract today uh, today artificial intelligence is only an upcoming technology so you cannot imagine that during the le- uh, lease period ai driven trucks will be the in thing and your supplier will then substitute all your trucks with ai driven trucks no too far fetched the next one is if the actual use or performance of the asset is way different than what was the expected use and performance as on the date of inception for example in this case you cannot think okay in such a case my supplier will be very angry and he will substitute my car with a truck no such an event cannot be considered while assessing substantive substitution rights the third one is if the supplier enters into an agreement with a future customer who agrees to pay way higher than the market rate so let us say you are uh, Im- you are imagining that if an mnc comes up in future and they are ready to pay my supplier a lot more money for my for the trucks he has given me then he will take away my trucks this means he has substantive substitution rights no such a situation also you cannot uh, consider finally if there is a substantial change in the market freight price of the asset during the period of use for example let us say you have leased an electrical truck from the supplier right now there are not many uh, charging stations in the country and so demand and price of electrical trucks is low now once more and more charging stations come there may be a sudden increase in the demand as well as the price of electrical trucks in this case you cannot say that oh my supplier will then take away the truck from me replace it with a fuel driven truck and give this electrical truck to higher uh, rent paying customers no this is also another thing that you cannot imagine few substantive substitution is a little complicated but there is some good news let us say you cannot easily assess if your supplier has substantive substitution rights or not in this case you can assume that there is no substantive substitution rights and apply ifrs 16 now one uh, tip that i have is try to think of myself not as a lessee but as a buyer as a buyer i will not be comfortable if my asset is not clearly stated in the contract or my asset can be substituted by the uh, owner whenever he likes right so if i would not be comfortable with a contract as a buyer it means i would not be comfortable with it as a lessee and therefore it is not a lease contract so this is one tip that i have to understand uh, um, or where these criteria are coming from so yes so we are done with the topic of identified asset like i said an underlying asset will be considered an identified asset if it has a distinct identity if it is clearly stated in the contract and if the supplier has no substantive substitution rights before i move on to the next topic i want to cover another topic and that is important dates the two dates that i will be covering are date of inception and date of commencement 
Now, date of inception is the date when you will be assessing all the different criteria on whether a contract qualifies as a lease or not. Uh, let us look at uh, this with this example. So, uh, here Harry and Vernon are agreeing on leasing out four private drive for five years at a rent of £3,000 every month. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you will be scandalized because there's no way Harry is ever going back into four private drive. Uh, but let's go with this example. Uh, let us say that they agree on these terms on 1st Jan 2021. They enter into a formal rent agreement only on 15 Jan 2021. And as per this agreement, Harry can move in and start using the house from 1st Feb 2021. So here you see there are three dates. 1st Jan 2021 is the date when they agree to the principal terms of the contract. 15 Jan 2021 is the date of the agreement. And 1st Feb 2021 is the date when the house is available for use by Harry. Which of these do you think is the date of inception? I think most of us will be tempted to say 1st Feb 2021 because that is when the lease terms begins. But you'll be surprised to know that the day when the asset is made available for use is not even important in deciding the date of inception. The date of inception is the earlier of the date on which the principal terms are agreed and the date of the agreement. In this case, we will compare 1 Jan and 15 Jan. Since 1 Jan is earlier, this is known as the date of inception. Which is the date of commencement? Date of commencement is 1st Feb, that is when Harry can start using the asset or when the asset is made available for use by the lessee. Now, there's one interesting situation. Uh, let us say Harry wants to renovate the house before moving in and Vernon agrees to let him into the house for renovation works on 20th Jan. In this case, the date of commencement would be 20th Jan and not 1st Feb. Right. So that is what that is why the word made available for use is important. Why is the date of commencement important? Uh, this is the date when the lease will be recorded in the books of accounts uh, of the lessee, as well as uh, this is the date uh, which we take into consideration while deciding if a lease term is short term or long term. So thank you very much for uh, watching this video. Uh, I really, really appreciate all your comments uh, on my previous video. Uh, some of the comments related to me doing videos on other standards and I will do it. I just want to finish IFRS 16 first. Um, I'm so sorry that I have not been very regular. It's, it's, things have been hard because of the pandemic. Um, Anyways, I will be more regular next year. So thank you once again. Uh, wish you all a very happy new year in advance. Uh, hope 2022 will be kinder to us than 2021. Bye.